We're about to commence the proceedings uh, for this evening. I'd ask that we stand for the opening prayer, which will be done by Mr. Michael Berg, Chief Personal Officer Acting. And I ask that you also remain standing for the national anthem, which will be played on pan by Rodney Small. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are in our midst, that you are God supreme, that you are God exalted. We pray that, Lord, as we seek to honor you tonight, that you remind us, Lord, that as we come together as public servants, our greater calling, Lord, are to be servants of you. So, Father, we pray that you would bless all that is done tonight. Let it be done unto your honor and your glory. Let, Lord, those who are given the authority, Lord, to speak tonight, speak, Lord, with a voice that is from the heavens, a voice that is from your throne, so that, Lord, our hearts would be touched. We would leave here blessed and refreshed, revitalized, ready and willing to take on the challenges of our daily work activities. So, Father, we thank you that you have made it possible for this night to happen. We thank you for your blessings and we pray for your guidance. All these things we ask in the first Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Minister and Minister of the Public Service, Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, Minister of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, the Honorable Luke Brown, Minister of Education, Sinclair Jimmy Prince, Minister of National Mobilization, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson. Chairman of the Public and Police Services Commissions, Mr. Cecil Blazer Williams, other board members of the Public Service Commission, Cabinet Secretary, Ms. Katyun Barnwell, Permanent Secretaries and Heads of Departments, CEOs and Directors of Public Service Authorities, 
past permanent secretaries of the Public Service Ministry, past directors of the Public Service Reform Unit, executive and other members of the Public Service Union, fellow public servants, members of the media, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, and those viewing on VC3 and listening on the National Broadcasting Corporation NBC Radio. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the Methodist Church Hall in Kingstown for the public lecture by the Dr. The Honorable Ralph V. Gonzalez, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in commemoration of Public Service Week with Public Service Appreciation Day being tomorrow. The task, of course, this evening to officially welcome you is not mine. So at this time, I would like to invite to the podium and to bring you the official welcoming remarks, Cabinet Secretary, Ms. Katyan Barnwell. Please welcome her as she comes. Thank you very much, our chairperson, Ms. Dion John, Director, API. Dr. The Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, Prime Minister and Minister of the Public Service, Ministers of Government, members of our viewing and listening audience, the Chairman of the Public and Police Service Commissions, Mr. Cecil Blazer Williams, other members of the Police and Public Service Commissions, Permanent Secretaries, Heads of Department, Heads of Statutory Corporations, representatives of the private sector, fellow public servants, both retired and currently serving, our invited guests and our stakeholders, members of the media, a pleasant good, afternoon, good evening to everyone. I am honored to be here tonight to welcome you to this public lecture by our Honorable Prime Minister on the occasion of our celebration of Public Service Week 2016. This week is being celebrated on the theme Productivity and Service Excellence in the Public Sector. And I'm sure we will all agree that this is timely, it's relevant, and it is something that we can all relate to, both as public servants and persons who benefit from the services that we provide. The, week, the week's program has been led and organized by the Public Sector Reform Unit, which is part of the Office of the Prime Minister. I see Mr. Harry and other members of staff here. They, of course, we have all been ably assisted by our colleagues from throughout other ministries and departments in the public service who have approached the task with a great measure of enthusiasm. So we'd like to thank them for their support. The week of activities commenced with a church service that was held last Monday at the New Testament Church of God, Wilson Hill. It was very successful in terms of the energy and that was generated and the sense of togetherness, unity that was very much present. The actual public service day though will be observed tomorrow on the 23rd. And we would like to extend a very warm invitation to everybody present here and listening to be part of our public service exhibition, which will be staged in Kingstown on the site of the former, now demolished, Treasury Building that is close to the Post Office Building. What did we set out to do when we decided to celebrate, join the rest of the international community in celebrating Public Service Week? We really wanted to bring into focus the work of public servants throughout the various departments and ministries. We also wanted to foster closer ties to the persons whom we serve on a daily basis and who are really the reason that we can wear the label public servants. It is also intended to create a greater level of cohesiveness and unity in our, among our ranks so that we can be unified in our vision, in our sense of purpose, as we deliver the services that we are paid to deliver. I am well aware that all of this activity will bring attention to our successes and accomplishments. 
I'm also very keenly aware that these activities may well bring into focus our shortcomings, deficiencies, and failures, and that is as it should be. As public servants, we must be commended for the positive things that we accomplish. We must also be held to account when we do not work, produce, and deliver at the accepted standards. We have to be tireless in our efforts to be better at what we do. I am keenly looking forward to hearing our Honorable Prime Minister this evening as he shares with us his thoughts and views on these unrelated matters. We will all benefit from his wisdom and experience. As he is often heard to say, he has been around since before Facebook and before the computer became an integral part of our daily lives. So if you think that there is a lot of information on the internet, then you should listen closely to this lecture tonight. You will receive information that has been distilled through lived experience, years of disciplined study, and deep and thoughtful reflection. There is simply no substitute for this. We are certainly in for a treat. So once again, I won't prolong the welcome. I just want to thank you for being here with us and for listening, following us, and for giving support to our week of activities and to welcome you very warmly to this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, CAPSEC. And of course, uh, the CAPSEC pointed out the activities which were held uh, throughout the week. Uh, Monday's church service, I'm sure you would agree, was very faith-building and very rewarding. The sermon was just excellent. And uh, let me at this time take the opportunity to welcome the Honorable Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture, the Honorable Cecil Mackey. Welcome and we are happy to have you here. Uh, we'll proceed at this time, but just to say that uh, we're also going live on Star FM, so we welcome our listeners to on Star Radio 2. Our next uh, remarks we'll hear from uh, the Chairman of the Police and Public Service Commissions, Mr. Cecil Blazer Williams, please put your hands together and welcome him as he comes. Thank you very much, Sister Chairperson. Or you don't say sister when you say chairperson. <laughs> Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Ralphie Gonzalez, Ministers of Government and um, other parliamentarians, if they're present, my colleagues in the Public Service Commission, Police Service Commission, senior public servants, permanent secretaries, heads of department. I am wondering basically if I can um, discover junior public servants. I'm, I'm looking to see if I can find them, but protocol would say I address the senior public servants first. Ladies and gentlemen, we are dealing here this evening with a lecture on the public service and this will be delivered by the Honorable Prime Minister. I am just going to make a few remarks. Usually I send on the program brief remarks, but I'm usually brief. Clearly, the public service has evolved over the years. We've come through colonial period, we've come through statehood and we to independence, and we're into what you might call the post-independence era. And we've seen many changes in keeping with the developments internally and externally. Because as we grow and as we develop, we have to deal with forces and factors 
which operate outside and within our country. And therefore, we have to develop within the public service the kind of personnel that would be able to handle matters of an international and regional nature. Internally, we have new dimensions in various sectors of our society and economy. And as such, we have to be equipped to deal with these new developments, which require new skills and new attitudes. Because if we do not develop new attitudes, we would be left behind. And since we are talking about efficiency, then efficiency must mean more than input and output to us. We have to go beyond this concept of efficiency being a matter of being able to produce more with less. You get a greater output with less input. That is the, the, the concept. However, efficiency goes beyond that. We have a common saying in the, uh, not only the legal profession, but it's, it's well known. Justice, justice must not only be done, it must appear also to have been done. So it is not a matter of how many convictions you get in the court of law, but it is whether really people are satisfied that justice has been done. And so, when we talk about the public service, we're talking about a service, a public service which provides goods, provides goods and services to the society, to the public. And in providing goods and services, we operate within a particular framework. And that is the framework of the public service with its um, regulations and with its orders, CSOs. But uh, we have to ask this question again. Efficiency, yes. But how do we deal with this role of providing goods and services in an efficient way if we are not able to facilitate the process? And I raise this issue of facilitation in relation to the public service because it is important that the private sector, those who are involved in commerce, those who are involved in industry, are able to operate in such a way that they are facilitated in their work and their commitment to develop the country and not be frustrated. There is a difference between facilitation and frustration. And public servants ought to understand that if they are providing goods and services and they are dealing, interfacing with people who are concerned and involved with the development of the country in commerce and in industry and in cultural activity, that of course, you might be in a position where you're involved in regulating. But in regulating, make sure that you have the interest of what those persons are trying to do for the development of the country.
Never forget that. What is the purpose of my work here? To prevent, and I'm going to be a little specific, to prevent or to give an importer problems in getting his goods cleared at the customs. Do we try our best to make sure that that person gets his goods out in time to meet certain demands so that the society can function properly? I make these remarks because there have been complaints. And we need to deal with this issue of facilitation. Because that is what drives the economy. That is what drives commerce. Another point I want to raise, and you're talking, we're talking about efficiency. Another point I want to raise has to do with actual workings within departments of our government. It is that when public servants operate in a particular way that is not in the best interest of the department and the work itself, supervisors, heads of department, or two, be willing and be brave enough, bold enough to say to that person or those persons that you are doing wrong and you are supposed to operate in this way. And they must be prepared to put it in writing. One of the biggest problems we have in the public service, you know, is that people are afraid to write things that assist in the process of keeping proper order within and discipline within the public service. And uh, we have had a few developments which I think have been unfortunate. I'm, I'm, being, I'm, I'm sounding somewhat a little uh, negative tonight, but I think it is important because we want to create what I call positivity. And um, I, I, I have to be a little careful how I deal with this. But the point I want to really make is that you cannot at times blame the Public Service Commission for not taking action against individuals when there is not one single adverse report before the Commission on any particular individual. I've seen it, and we have to understand that if you, again, if the public servants are complaining against another public servant, they must be willing and ready to put it in writing when they ask to do so, because the Public Service Commission is sometimes embarrassed when, because we are told that this matter is urgent, it involves the safety maybe of public servants, and we have to act, but there is no backup writing, so to speak, there's nothing in writing, but because of the nature of the, of the, um, the situation, we have to act. And when we act, and we ask for the backup information, nobody wants to put anything in writing. And we're embarrassed. And I'm saying that you're going to find a different approach. Because we need 
to put or how you put it? Put your, your, your money where your mouth is. This time, put your hand where your mouth is in writing. Um, that was a little bit of, um, how should I put it? Negativity with the idea of creating positivity. I want to predict that next 20 years, there will be one single employment act to cover the private sector and the public sector with some safeguards for public servants. That is what I see happening next 20 years, by, by, by um, next 20 years. I also foresee that uh, individuals may not have to worry about asking for an extension of service. I foresee that you're going to work, if possible, until you fall. And this is tied into the fact that the cost of uh, maintaining pensions or paying gratuities in a small society with greater demands will become more and more difficult. And so you're not going to have two parallel pension schemes. The National Insurance Service is going to be the sole authority to deal with pensions in this country next 20 years. I made these predictions because the public service as it is today would have to adapt, would have to adjust to meet changing circumstances. And so um, I hope that tonight's lecture will be of great interest to all of us and will benefit public servants, and by public servants I'm also talking about the, the police, I'm talking about you know, the, the, the nurses that we have, I'm talking about all persons really who are involved uh, and are being paid from the public purse. And so ladies and gentlemen, I want to Thank you for listening to my negativity and hope that I can get some positivity from that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. It seems as if this week we, as public servants, are being flooded with very timely messages, and I'm sure you will agree. I, I particularly like the concept which he coined aptly, I, uh, the idea of negativity to promote positivity. And of course, we've all got a responsibility to ensure that we, the keepers of, uh, the, of, of our various departments, that we put the necessary mechanisms in place to ensure that we, we facilitate the process, as uh, the chairman rightly said. Uh, this evening, uh, we're going to move uh, smoothly along to bring our next speaker. And uh, our next speaker has just returned from giving, I'm, I'm not sure how many persons are aware of this, what was a very outstanding lecture in Grand Cayman last week. And of course, which received excellent, excellent reviews. And uh, this evening, he congratulated, well, in fact, earlier this week on Monday, he congratulated and commended public servants for the work they continue to do for the development of our beautiful country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this evening, he is here to bring us the lecture to mark this grand observance of Public Service a Week, in particular, Public Service Day tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzales, and Minister of the Public Service.
Madam Chairperson, the Chairman of the Public Service and Police Service Commissions, the Director of Public Prosecution, the Commission of Police, Permanent Secretaries, former Senior Permanent Secretaries and other Permanent Secretaries of the an earlier period, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, and I believe there are persons who are listening to us on the radio, probably seen us on VC3. I want also very much to recognize my cabinet colleagues who we were together at cabinet all day. Today was a long day. And I'm very happy to be here to talk about the ongoing quest for enhanced productivity and a better delivery of service in the public service. I want to go back a little. On the 10th of August 1999, I at this very Methodist Church Hall on the occasion of the 29th anniversary, 29th conference, sorry, of the Caribbean Public Service Association, and at the invitation of the Public Service Union of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I delivered the Dr. Kenrick Rennie Memorial Lecture entitled Survival of the Public Worker in the 21st Century. I was at that time the recently elected political leader of the Unity Labour Party, then in opposition. And those who are interested in reading that speech, it's available in the book authored by me entitled The Politics of Our Caribbean Civilization, Essays and Speeches. It's out of print, but I'm told that they have copies at the library. So some 17 years after that speech, I am here with our public servants and others yet again at the same venue, this time to speak at the invitation of the Cabinet Secretary and her organizing team on the occasion of Public Service Week to address the particular subject which is on your program on which I've just indicated. Now, this is a subject I've been reflecting on for a long time. I gave you the, not quite the midway point in 1999, but I started to, to, to read and think about the subject seriously from 1966 when I entered the University of the West Indies as a social science student. That's 50 years ago. And during that time, I've done a few things. Um, my studies and my life's experiences, different areas of work. So I believe that I may have a few things to say. I've watched the public service from outside, and I've been engaged with them with the public service and public servants very closely for the last nearly 16 years. I think with that background and experience, I hope I have some things to say which may be helpful. At least I will give up some of my observations and experiences and with some suggestions as some possible solutions. Now, when people come to the public service, they approach it as though it is an entity which has come from the outside, hovering, descends upon us like a 
lesser god, small g, deus ex machina. But it is important for us to ground what we are talking about on the first observation that the existing constitutional and legal framework within which the public service operates this framework possesses strengths and possibilities despite its several weaknesses and limitations for enhanced national development greater productivity and better service there is a constitution which governs the public service there's a body of laws which governs the public service and the police service and the teaching service and there are regulations now people who are listening may say well that might be obvious but a lot of things which happen from, public, from the public's perception, either for good or ill, it must take place within a particular framework, legal and constitutional. And if, if you transgress, there is an institution called the law courts, which you can, which the citizen, the aggrieved citizen can go ultimately for redress through one of the several prerogative writs, injunction, mandamus, to compel it to do something, prohibition, sociorari, under the general rubric nowadays of judicial review. That's there. So when the public servant functions, there is an ultimate oversight, but intermediate between its functioning and that ultimate oversight, there are other authority centers to which the individual public servant is responsible. In other words, the public service and public servants are not laws unto themselves. Very fundamental. So the public service functions within a rationalist matrix of laws, rules and institutional arrangements, which engender or facilitate public responsibility, responsiveness, and accountability. The laws and regulations touching and concerning the public service, public servants, financial administration, and governance have served our nation well, relatively speaking. This is something, again, which persons who are nowadays complaining about every single thing, some persons, because there are some persons, as soon as a challenge arises, there are complaints. And the rules have to be bent to facilitate your own personal interest and complaint, according to some people. And when this is not done that way, it's a bunch of jokers and lawless people you have inside of the public service. And if you don't get a result which you like, it is injustice. So the story goes. But I have to repeat a point which at a time when several persons who should know better seek to engender lawlessness and confusion that in fact there's a constitution their bodies of laws, their regulations, governing the function of the public service and the public servants. And they are answerable, both to the public in a broad political sense, 
through their representatives in parliament and ultimately at the elections. But they are also responsible to internal procedures and systems and hierarchies. Now I know when we speak of hierarchies, in this day and age where information communications technology has shaken the foundations of hierarchies in your family, You have to accommodate yourself to the challenges. But total confusion would exist in the family if there are no hierarchies of authority. And everywhere you would have to have hierarchies. These are not hierarchies ascribed by a divine right to be present somewhere in the public service, but through a process of recruitment, appointment, and promotion. These things are not mysteries. But of course, we have to function as public servants within the changing environment, taking into account a number of factors, including the more, the, the requisite for openness and greater transparency, derived in part from the revolution in information communications technology, but a sensibility about the necessity and desirability of openness and accountability and transparency. We have the Public Service Commission, the hierarchical authority structures in the public service, permanent secretaries, heads of departments, other ranks, the office of the director of audit, Very important office, an independent office. The tenders board, the law courts. And if the public servants get into any difficulties with the criminal law, the independent office of the director of public prosecution. The offices of the governor general in some circumstances, and of course the offices, the office of the governor general in some circumstances and the office of the Prime Minister, the Cabinet, and Parliament in others. So that's the first bundle of issues, the constitutional legal framework and its rationalists. Sometimes people may say that the law is an ass. Ebenezer Joshua, I remember as a boy used to quote Aristotle, said that the law is right reason. The lawyers only know the sections in the law book and the cases. And basically, law is right reason, though sometimes some of the exceptions to certain rationalist positions may lead one to question that. But human experience would teach that those exceptions are necessary and desirable, where the law makes those exceptions. The second matter, which we have to look at, Again, not something obvious, but we have to say these obvious things to draw them to our consciousness in Public Service Week and tomorrow's World Public Service Day. Because if we don't, we can get lost. And the discussion could be all over the place. Secondly, we acknowledge that the public service functions more broadly within the context of a competitive parliamentary democracy with constitutionally protected fundamental rights and freedoms, a vibrant free press, a mixed economy awash with economic freedoms, a sufficiency, not an abundance, a sufficiency of material means for civilized life and living generally, because despite all our difficulties, we have not descended into barbarism in this country. We have um, civilized life and live, life and living, and there's a material base which sustains that civilized life and being. A modern and sophisticated society within the frame of an ennobling Caribbean civilization, 
a well-functioning state system with regional and international linkages. All of these connected factors in the real world of life and living ensure the sustainability of the public service as a viable and vital institution for the delivery of blazers pointed out of public goods and services to the nation. Of course, to be sure, within the public service there are weaknesses and limitations, some of which are structural and others are day-to-day -day operational or even episodic in nature. Sometimes somebody will call me about something. It's neither institutional, neither institutional weakness, nor in fact something operational. It's very episodic. I would say, girl, I say, boy, you're going to lose any sleep over that? We got more important things to do, man. Don't bother yourself with that. Don't worry about episodic mischief. Undoubtedly, there is need for further public sector reform of both a structural and operational kind. And I will talk of some of these to lift further productivity and service to the people. But many of the difficulties encountered in the public service as currently structured and operated can be resolved by public servants themselves. And the public servants so persuasively inform me there are structural problems, institutional weaknesses, some operational ones, but it is within the public servants themselves to address many of the problems which we have, many of the challenges which we face. And I would list some of the ways in which the productivity and service can be enhanced through individuals acting singly and in collectives in the public service. So I begin, those of you who are always fascinated with systems analysis, I begin by sketching an environment which is here. What exists outside the people, the economy, the political, competitive political system, the, the economy, the laws, and everything. And this is the environment, and this is the civil service system, or the public service system. And the environment affects this public service. But there are things within the public service itself, institutions within it, and structures which we have to take account of, and people who work in it. And then out of that, work, those workings of the public service, influenced by the environment and also contained influence by what is happening inside, including people, and then you deliver the outputs. And we are seeking for the outputs in our lecture to be enhanced. We are seeking better service. And of course, there is always a feedback from those decisions which come back to the environment and come to the public service structures themselves. If it is positive, it strengthens what you're doing in the environment and in the public service. If it's negative, well, we have to find a way to turn those negatives into positives, those weaknesses and limitations into strengths and possibilities, to tie what Blazer was saying with a framework which I'm suggesting. So I want, having set that broad frame, I'll come back to some things within it, but I want to address what is inside with the public servants themselves. And I've listed 10 matters, very briefly. Some of them may sound 
so mundane and ordinary. But there are a lot of things which are mundane and sounding ordinary, even boring. But they're very important. The first one, it's almost as if I'm a pastor talking about it. You know, the literature in theology says it, it begins with you. There's, a, there's, even, there's even a song on that. There's even a beautiful hymn on it. It begins with me and you. And a lot of times, you know, and I'll say a little about that too, because I make observations. I don't say something. I don't, I don't speak about my observations all the time. I internalize them and I factor them in my head and they influence me in asking somebody to do something or not do something or in my relations with them. Because there are some people who don't think it has anything to do with them at all. It has to do with everybody else. And they have a commentary about every single thing else. Why? In a broader context, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt in the United States, in 1910, in the Sorbonne in Paris, addressed this question. And he's talking about the quality of a citizen. It's the man in the arena, the woman in the arena, the one who is doing things, not the one who is sniping. Whether they're inside the public service sniping or on the outside sniping. As I always say, so Christopher Wren designed and supervised the construction of St. Paul's Cathedral. And when he was building it, they thought that he was a madman. But it's one of you going to London is one of the the marvels. So beautiful. Same thing when when Solomon was building the temple to house the Ark of the Covenant. Why are you spending so much money on that? Why are you buying so much? Why are you having so much gold and silver and bronze and all the seed of Lebanon and you're nicing up the thing so much just for the temple? Just to house the Ark of the Covenant? You're wasting your time. People don't have any patience with it. Of course, though it was destroyed, it was a marvel and remains historically and theologically a marvel. And I, all, I give several examples. I gave one the other day about from another form of another area in Blazer's area of poetry. John Keats in the 19th century, early 19th century, he died when he was 28 years old. He wrote a very long poem called Endymion. Of course, he was suffering from an incurable disease, something which we cure easily these days, TB. Um, or consumption, I used to call it in the old days. Wrote a long poem called Endymion. And the critics panned him to help to hasten the man's death. In fact, I, I like Keats so much for all of these things. The first time I went to Rome, I asked the people in the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs, I want to see where Keats lived before he died. And he, he lived in Rome. Nobody remembers the critics at all. Well, certainly, no serious person remembers the critics. They remember Keats and Endymion, which is a masterpiece, a poetic masterpiece. So I want to begin with some things with us, individually, each public servant. I just read them out as I wrote them down. Love your job. That might sound so ordinary this way. People leave their woman on Thursday evening for here. I'll tell them love the job. <laughs> Wednesday, sorry. Wednesday? No. The point is this. All of us know that it's very important you have to love your job. And you have to respect and cooperate with your colleagues at work 
and you have to care for those whom you serve if you accept those basic things you're doing quite well you know you accept them and you're acting them out have integrity and as the permanent secretary in the ministry of education sister maureen williams who is the wife of the lord bishop in the pentecostal assembly of the west indies she took her, her chapter and verse yesterday at the church service was it yesterday monday at the church service so many things are happening are confusing the days like they're going one into the next i know tomorrow is thursday on parliament and i ain't seek permission to not to be there from the speaker so i will be there <laughs> um, so she told us about daniel daniel was a jew he believed in the god of abraham and he was working in Babylon. He was working really in the Persian Empire, which is now Iran. And he was selected to be in charge of all the regional administrators or satraps. That's what they call them, satraps. And why? The Bible put it easy, precise, because he had an excellent spirit. And loving your job, respecting and cooperating with your colleagues at work, and care for those whom you serve, and you have integrity, all those things make up. Daniel's excellent spirit and our excellent spirit, if we have them. So that's the first thing. Begins with us. So every day we go to work, we ask ourselves, really, should we be inside of this work? You know, we, we, we really want to, we, 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 we love people. We, 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 we want to create confusion with our colleagues. Or we really want to work with them good. Um, the people who, whom I'm serving, are they really a botheration to me? Are they a vexation to my spirit? Eh? Where they come worry me here for this morning? Eh? May I have my cup of coffee? <laughs> eh, where, 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 where come provoke me so early for? Eh? Not in any way of Caribbean fun or pecan, but seriously, basically tell them leave and go about their business. No. One attitude couldn't get you good, get you well in the business. Another one, you're not going anywhere. And invariably, those who make the most unjustified criticism are those who do not have, quote unquote, an excellent spirit. So the first thing, the excellent spirit, and I give what I consider some ingredients. The second, public servants ought to better acquaint themselves with the laws and regulations under which they function. It's amazing. Sometimes I would meet senior people in the public service. They don't read the laws which govern the public service. They're not acquainted with the provisions in the Constitution. And they don't know the Financial Administration Act. They don't know the public service regulations. They don't know the financial rules. Be it pursuant the Financial Administration Act and so on. Well, you can't play cricket or football or netball if you don't know the rules. The first thing you have to do is to learn the rules. And I'll tell you this. 
And I want the young professionals, especially, who go to university and come back very bright, bursting with knowledge. And many of them are quite eager to advance professionally. They're brimful with ideas. And I encourage that all the time. I ask you also just to take a breath. Slow down a little bit. Read the regulations under which you function. Read the laws. Not just the general textbooks which you have read. They give you concepts and ideas. Not a lecturer who spoke seemingly authoritatively but very polemically. And you think you know? A person in the system who ain't spend the time in university, one day in the university, would run rings around you in the public service. And you think that they have something against you. No. If you have some humility, you go to them and learn and find out where to find what. And know how you go about your, yourself. So that if you're in a position, you will know what to do. Because you have to know what to do. There are people who say to me, why do I not bring bright people from outside the public service and just put them in this or that position? I say, you see brightness? There are two types of brightness. Brightness which illuminates and brightness which blinds. In order to have a brightness which illuminates, you have to know the terrain around you. You have to know like Issachar, one of the leaders of the 12 tribes. In the book of the Chronicles, know the times and act accordingly. There are lessons, you know, I have not given you my experiences that I'm A person comes to you, sometimes you have, I have very intelligent persons who come to me in the public service. They say, Prime Minister, we have this thing inside of the, the estimates. And I have written to the Ministry of Finance and tell them about this. I say, yes. It's inside, the stand, it's inside the standpipe, but you have to open the standpipe in order to get the water. And in order to open the standpipe, you have to do a thing called request for a release, and you have to send your, your, your work program, and you have to actually release. You just can't just write a letter tell you this money is inside of the, the estimates. You want it. It doesn't happen like that at all. And sometimes they may come and complain and say, look, I had told, I, I went to the meetings with the budget director and this didn't go inside of the estimates. They tell me it was going to go in and it never went in. No, I can't get this thing done. I said, well, there may be some account from which you could via it for the time being. And not delay the land, you don't send, except it's extreme urgency, a special warrant too early in the financial year because they're going to hold it up in finance and if they don't hold it up, I will hold it up and don't sign it. <laughs> so, but if it's something genuinely very urgent, unforeseen, you apply for a special warrant. Now, these are things you must know the rules. I'm, I'm addressing some which are fairly obvious. But you would be surprised to know how many times in, any, in every one week I will have to just slow people down a little bit and say, have you done this? It's a rationalist system. The laws and regulations in relation to the public service, they are available. And the public service servants ought to read them. I want to say that I'm told that there's some difficulty in finding copies of the, 
civil service regulations the orders sorry it's online now praise god well you see well you can't complain anymore it's at your fingertips and of course i see the training division and the public service commission here we can do a lot more of that and some of the senior public servants should do a little refresher because sometimes they forget some of the things thirdly better and more productive attitudes to work and production need to be inculcated and made manifest at the workplace most public servants are disciplined in their work but we all here know who are public servants that there are too many who are addicted to lateness absenteeism time watching and time wasting and some disruptive work attitudes and you have some examples you know i'd name a few but you can have others excessive bickering and complaining often about trivia i mean if you if you get up one morning and go to the bathroom and you turn on the the tap and you don't you can't get any water you call your neighbor your neighbor has water you don't throw a tantrum there may be one of several reasons why you you must ask yourself first if you pay the water bill yeah. <laughs> there's some obvious things before you start to no but even if you throw the tantrum say what the hell i mean i don't have any water here this morning ask yourself first did i pay the water bill did god them cut me off and then you say well no i pay my water bill and the water was here yesterday and so on you may ask your husband to go and see if they stop talk outside somebody turn it off if all that is in order it may just be a need a plumber if your husband or you can't just screw the thing have a, a wrench and screw it and put in the washer or that's maybe all you need you know pastor but you don't create a scene you just take it in your strides and you solve the problem so i'm urging just take a when it happens sometimes you're under pressure you just cool it and if somebody comes and sound a little agitated just say we just we just we can deal with that that's not a big thing to to force yourself too much about of course you have a lot of interpersonal jealousies the sources of which are myriad then i don't know how people whether you're listening to star you're listening to nice radio you're listening to we fm or boom whichever one i don't understand how people could tell me that they're inside a room doing work listening to other people have the radio on very high tell me they could concentrate they could do two three things at one and the same time no i just don't understand how people can do that and we have to try to see if we can get this thing in the public service stop every everybody listening to radio well not everybody so many people i mean listen to the radio on your on your on your own time there's a lot of things to listen to on the radio i know when i say that they say oh you want control what i listen to now and i said star or or nice or boom or or extreme or whichever one you 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 know you have your work to do man then 
You know, one of the things with technology, we have to learn to tame technology and civilize it. You go inside an office, okay, I understand that somebody may get an urgent telephone call. They see it, you know, you have your... Because some people, they don't put their, their phone on silent. And some people have some ringtones, which are like some discotheques. <laughs> and they last for a prolonged period. But you will go to an office, and somebody's on the phone, leisurely holding a conversation, while you're standing up waiting on them to be served. I mean, that's why I talk about taming and civilizing the technology. Because you wouldn't like anybody to do that to you. Then, there are two cases. I ask a permanent secretary. I wouldn't call the name of the permanent secretary. I say, how oh, you could have two people inside of your ministry driving minibus when they should be at work in the morning? He's saying you were one, but not the other. <laughs> and then I ask, as the one is tolerable. So I ask if they have a book where you're writing. You log in when you arrive. If, there's, if they're not supervisors who would report, the same point that Blazer made just now. Man, look, people, the public can't pay you to work on a driving minibus. It's as simple as that. And then the number of people, they, don't, they lack the focus on for assigned tasks. So that's the third one. Fourth, cutting out the misuse or abuse of government property for personal or other people's benefit. You know, I'm proud to say that since we came to office, ministers are no longer from driving government vehicles. I think you'll notice that. I told them very early, By the terms of the employment of the Governor General and the Prime Minister, we are the only two who, are, who, by our employment and our status in the system, who have government vehicles assigned personally to us with a driver. I will never be found driving G7 because it's not my vehicle. The government. If I want to drive a vehicle, I have one which I can drive. By election time, I have the Picancara. <laughs> but you know that there are several public servants who misuse and abuse government property, including vehicles. You can't be seen with government vehicles at all hours of the day and night and on weekends taking your family to church on a, on a morning or the evening before you go out with your partner them to a to, to go to go to a a, a disco I hope we don't see any public servants with government vehicles um, at places over the carnival. I understand some strange names of some, some events, slippery when wet, <laughs> and other such, such ventures. So I think it's important that, because when people see you driving government vehicles about broad daylight, and you're abusing 
public government property, property like that? They ask the legitimate question. If you're doing this thing in broad daylight, what are you going to do? In the dark. You know, it's a... You can't deal with public property in that manner. And the people who are responsible for this are the permanent secretaries and the heads of departments. You are the ones. Fifth, you know leadership is so important. And we have some good leaders in the public service. But you know, we have some examples of less than optimal leadership. And we have to bring those brothers and sisters up to speed and they have to realize their own weaknesses. When you, re when you arrive at the position of a leader, you have to be able to tell even your best friend in the public service, you're coming to work too late, you're absenting yourself too much, you're bickering too much, you're doing this, you're doing that. Because if you don't, the thing is going to fall apart around you. Six, you have to organize your work schedule or programs in a practical way, and you have to make sure that the, the members of staff buy into this program. I don't know how some people can run a ministry as a head of a ministry, a permanent secretary, a cabinet secretary, and don't assign a day sometime during the week with your relevant staff, and I leave that to you to define who are relevant, who are senior, who are to hold a meeting and say, what have we been doing? What are we supposed to do this week? What are we supposed to do next week? And you, 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 those who are assigned tasks, you get to them and say, Liz, this is what we expect you to do. Then we have to have internal checks and management performance audits and to see that they're carried out on an ongoing basis. One of the problems which we have had is that we have never been able in the public sector reform unit to master this question of how are we measuring public servants' performance. It's a difficult thing to measure, but we have to make better efforts because you have to measure what are the, the results. Number eight, I put it by itself, and I just state it, and you know what I mean. Leave your personal problems outside the office. Leave them there. Number nine, work in coordinated ways, unified us towards set goals, and avoid divisiveness. Number ten, be neutral in a party political sense. At the same time, you respect the wishes, the democratic wishes of the people and understand that the government sets policies within the framework of the constitution and the law. And you are required to implement professionally with commitment those policies which are lawfully made and within the constitution and the law. A public servant is not a political psychophant either of the ruling party of the opposition party. He or she is a servant of the people with a specified role in the state administration, a very specific role. You know, there are some people, Angie could tell you, Angela, Maxima, those who are around me, the cabinet secretary, when people come to me and they think public servants that they think they could bottom me up with a whole set of ULP rhetoric and want to think that I born yesterday and they do it without any reason and you know you know it when you see it and I happen to know that such a person is not necessarily one who is even committed to you politically. There's no need to be psychophantic. 
And of course, there is absolutely no need for you to think that you are a resident member of the parliamentary opposition. Because there's a role for that. You can have, engage in your political activism on the streets, or you can come and run for a seat in parliament or be appointed as a senator. But you are a professional in the public service. You will have your preferences. And I happen to know some public servants who historically have supported the opposition party, but who are good public servants. And very often, your relationships are such that you hear sometime late after election, you know, so and so went and gave you the vote, you know. Because you have to respect one another and you have to be professional. Support who you want to support. And I know in the Ministry of the Public Service, we are seeking to finalize a code of ethics for the public service and a charter for the public service. And they will certainly help us in addressing some of these issues which I've been talking about. More widely, having addressed some of those personal things, and I think it was important to spend a little time on them, and I hope in which I'm talking about in a conversational way, they're not hard on your ears. That is easy for us to follow, and I'm interested in us solving these problems. As I say, I reiterate, the vast majority of public servants are good people who do good work. But you have, you know, if you have a small department, a small unit with 10 people, and two of them just set out in causing confusion and bickering, it, it can, it can um, humbug the whole, you may say, is... 80% is holding their own, but 2, 20% creating difficulties. But that 20% can do so much damage and hold back the other 80% of the people. Of course, we have instituted several important reforms already. Some of them are institution, some of them are organizational. For example, setting up of specific units, agencies, and departments for specific tasks. We have appointed personnel appropriate to tasks. There's a widespread application and upgrade of information technology. We're doing that on an ongoing basis. The reclassification exercise. You know, people take that for granted. But the reclassification exercise, I remember when we embarked on it, Oh, not to ask me if I was a, a madman. He tell me, say, Ralph, the one in Jamaica, they even reach halfway, and it's 20 years they're doing at it now. He said, I've been involved in one, and we're not moving anywhere near as fast. We began this process in 2004, thereabouts, and by 2007, we concluded it, and a little sweep up slightly thereafter. And that reclassification exercise, as we knew, redefined jobs, provided appropriate remuneration. Like, for instance, it made a big difference in the police force, to give an example. The police officers, when they start, when they swear them in at the training school and to, to be police officers, they started at the level just below junior clerk. The reclassification had them starting at senior clerk, which you know you, you get after about 10 years and you have to pass the exam, the bar exam, and go past the bar and so on and so forth. And there are people who met me at the beginning, they say, but well, you know, I, I have A-levels and I'm a junior clerk again, so and so. This fellow who was in my class, was a policeman, didn't, you know, drop out, you get three or four CXC. And look, I got eight or nine, and I got my three A levels, and look at what I, I say, well, 
if you want that salary, go and be a policeman. And they say, no, 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 you think I could take that on and so on, and they give you the reasons why they can't take it on. But the reclassification related not only to inputs, but very critically. Your outputs, what is the nature of the job you're doing? Very important in the reclassification exercise. And people were rewarded accordingly. Except, <laughs> except for the politicians. We were never, well, the, the powers that be, the cabinet probably thought that we were at the right level. <laughs> um, then, of course, I think it is true to say that we have improved the material conditions of work for the public servants, improved communications and participation, participation within the ministries and departments, within and between them, and with the public. And we have a lot more consultations and the like, and to sensitize the public on a number of things. But still, we have a lot more work to do in that regard, in being more responsive to the public. There are several institutional barriers arising from formal structures and solidified behavioral clusters of a non-formal kind which militate against enhanced productivity and excellence in service. Some have been highlight, already highlighted and others I will talk about and which demand ongoing correctives and correctives are suggested if we define the problem. The first one I'll talk about, which I touched on before, is something which I call Bureaucis. It's a kind of paralysis of the bureaucracy. <laughs> this is the incapacity of too many public servants to adjust positively to rationalism, formalism, routine, and procedures of organization. You notice, I don't consider rationalism, formalism, routine, and procedures of organization to be bad. You just have to utilize them for change and don't let them hold you backward. And you can utilize the law and the rules to carry the enterprise forward. But as I've indicated, there are some persons who just can't accommodate themselves to this kind of rationalism and order. And if you don't do it, confusion will reign and you will have a paralysis. In the opening of the book of Genesis, you don't have to take literally. People, Louis Straker, for instance, tells me he take the book of Genesis literally. And people read it and take it literally. But whether you do or not, I'm not involved in a theological argument on that. But what fascinates me about the book is the opening verses tells me about order out of chaos and normlessness. That is the beginning. You must have order. There will be routine things. There will be procedures. They don't have to hold you back. They only hold you back if you don't understand them and don't utilize them to carry you forward. Because we have been so constrained by a colonial bureaucracy and what they use the rules for, most of the rules are neutral and can be utilized for change and where those require changes. It is in our power. You can advise the government, the, the political directorate, listen, there are some rules on this thing which we need to change. There are some of them I would love to change, but, but they wouldn't help me because the, the public servants, for instance, everybody who is leaving to go and travel from the Lewis junior clerk to the highest in the land, in between, police, the same thing. I have to, it goes through a chain and it finally reaches to me. I have to give permission. Well, for heaven's sake, why can't the permanent secretary give permission for those? And if you're telling me a little senior up the ranks, we can say from maybe assistant secretary or senior assistant secretary, 
certainly the permanent secretary, heads of department. But why Michael had to send me the name of policemen who go into train? I don't refuse him. I just sign them. I'm like, I sign it like a robot. It comes from Michael Charles. It goes to the permanent secretary. Each of them approve it and they have two or three sets of papers attached to it. Then it comes to me. A whole set of bundles. If you see them, if you don't know what they are, they frighten you. You want to turn away. And she could tell you about them. I mean, that's a small thing, but there are several others. So we have too much centralization in some areas and too much diffusion or inchoateness in others. Thirdly, there's an insufficiency of popular controls and the inadequacy of some existing formal controls on the public service. Uh, counterproductive. Then, four days, and I find that there is on many issues an imprecise demarcation of many political and administrative rules. And if you do not have a clear demarcation, I understand that sometimes there are margins. But if you have an overzealous politician who want to grab authority, they can want to do things what the permanent secretary is doing. And if you have such an overzealous politician who want to do the permanent secretary work, you can rest assured that he or she would allow him or her the politician to do what they want to do, and the politician would get very little done. So there's a price for your overzealousness if you're a politician in making a power grabber. And you also have one or two senior public servants Sometimes they make a little grab for more than they really have. And some of you know them. And you have to watch them. Because you have to save them from getting themselves in trouble. Related to that is that there, there are too many frequent occurrences of manipulation and coercion of public servants by by senior public servants and ministers of government. Look, the politician has his role, the public servant has his, his role, his or her role too. And we gotta work together. And we have to respect one another. And work for the good of the country. Knowing that the government sets the policies, the public servants administrating, and the public servants can say to the to the, to the politician, you can't do it this way. If you do it this way, it would be unlawful. Or this way, though lawful, you can do it better. This other lawful way, and so on and so forth. That's, that's your role. That's how we are to work. Something which I see have, has been developing, and we need to examine it. Too many external agencies and even some governments from outside have too much of an unwholesome influence on public servants and even some politicians. If a particular government says something, they jump. If a particular agency says something, they jump. If the IMF says something, it doesn't mean the Ministry of Finance has to jump. If the idea is a good idea, we examine it. And then we adopt it and call it our own. Same thing in the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Food and Agricultural Organization. That's the reality. We should look at these things critically and don't allow them to overwhelm us. But what happens sometimes? You know, a lot of these agencies, you have to watch them. And sometimes the public servants may get a little overzealous with them and allow their influence because you know, sometimes the work here is boring. Maybe they want to go to Brazil to study the mating habits of boa weevils. <laughs> you know, and um, some international organization devoted. <laughs> You 
you know. So we have to we have to watch that. And they used to send for me. So and so wants to travel. And they write on it, the permanent secretary would write. There's no cost to the government. That means the government is not paying for the airfare, the trip, the, the accommodation or per diem. So early, early I've told them that they have to write no direct cost to the government. Because if you go into Brazil to study the mating habits of boa weevils for two weeks, there's certainly an indirect cost to the government that don't have you for two weeks. Huh? You're not doing your work here, Bev. You're not doing your work here. And the question is this. The esoteric study of the mating habits of boa weevils, not exactly at the top of the agenda in the Ministry of Agriculture. Might be interesting in a paper for a journal which 10 people in the world would read. <laughs> so then there is some public servants and, and people watch it, you know, some, thank God, not too many. But we have to be careful it doesn't become widespread. There's a thing which I call dramaturgy, impression management. There are some people who come to you, they devoid of substance in whatever they are doing, but I tell you, they could talk a good game for you. They could give you a paper, not saying many things, and you discover that really they're not doing any work. And I, we have to keep our, our eyes open for those who practice dramaturgy. Michael, you know some of them in the police force. Eh? And then there's an additional condition, which years ago I called bureaupathology. It is a condition of anxiety and a lack of a sufficiency of motivation and even loss of self. Thank God this is only a minority of public servants. But you know them, they, 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 they really, and you hear other public servants tell you that so and so they have a don't care attitude. They ain't care whether Monday fall, fall upon Thursday. They're just going through the motions. You know, somebody will tell you, well, you hear some people say, well, they, they only got two more years to go to retirement. They're watching out the time. You know, because they don't see a chance to get in the promotion and to get in the enhanced, the, en the enhanced pension because you have to have to be three years inside of the job if you're a public servant and one year there if you're a teacher. So they know the rules. And there are some younger ones who ain't care, they wait until the auntie sends for them for in America. Thank God that they are a small minority. But I come back to it. If it's only two in a group of, in a group of 10, it can create difficulties. And there's no need for that because there, there are lots of opportunities all the time. And you can't close them off. And you must have your own professional self-respect. And you have to remember people paying you. As I say, thank God, only a small number. And we have to make sure that they, they come along. And across the board, of course, there is the limitation of insufficient material resources to meet all the pressing demands. And that's why we have to be prudent in ensuring an efficient allocation and use of the scarce resources which are available. And this is a matter both for the policymakers and for the administrators. 
I know that there are complaints from several public servants regarding what they consider to be inadequate remuneration. And I would be the last person to say that public servants or anybody else don't need more money. But when the complaints are being made, I just simply ask that all of us consider the following facts. One, since 2001, the public servants have had real, a real increase after you take account of inflation in their salaries, a real increase of some 43%. The IMF made that point in the last report. Way in excess of productivity. And in excess of the 28% real increase in remuneration for the workers in the rest of the country. In other words, between 2001 and now, all the categories of the public servants, you may have an individual group here or there who may lag behind, but taken as a whole, they are doing, they have done, better off absolutely and comparatively with other workers than in 2001. And it means, therefore, that they are receiving absolutely and comparatively with other workers a greater share of the pie. I'm not saying that they don't even, they shouldn't even have more in some absolute sense. But we have to watch it in the real world, what is available and in relation to, to everybody else. Then the I want them I want when persons say, well no 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 no. I hear the argument. Where are you going with Vincent Beach? He's 80 something years old, he's still paying him. Well, that's a political appointment to do a particular job which I, as the Prime Minister, consider necessary and desirable. Surely I must be in the position to make a judgment on that. Otherwise, the people would not have entrusted me with the job. After all, I'm not an itinerant sanitation worker. Um, you're given a job and they expect you to do certain things and to get the supports around you. And I respect itinerant sanitation workers, but you don't repose that responsibility in them at that level to choose a consultant on national security. And even though you don't have him, as I don't have him now, the fact which I'm going to tell you remains the same. Because that is purely marginal. with such an appointment. Because over 60% of the revenue which we collect, the recurrent revenue, I'm not talking about loans and grants, of the taxes and charges which we collect in the central government, over 60% is consumed by salaries, wages, and allowances for public servants. The employer's contribution to the NIS, that is to say the government contribution to the National Insurance Service, and retirement benefits, gratuity and pensions for those who have retired. The personal emoluments alone amount to 50% of the current revenue. You know, in the OECS as a whole, personal emoluments on an average amount to 39.4% of current revenue. Call it 40%. I wronged it upwards. So you're talking about 10 percentage points more relative to our current revenue than the OECS average. I know what people say. We have, it is true, we have the Grenadines, and we have to duplicate a lot of services in the Grenadines. But even so, 50% is still very high of your current revenue. And then, you add 11.7% of the current revenue, which goes to retirement benefits, which is the fastest growing item of recurrent expenditure. Fastest growing item. 
In the OECS, the average for retirement benefits is just 7%. So you see, we are nearly 5 percentage points ahead of the OECS in that regard. Two other persistent complaints among many public servants relate to appointment and promotion. And surely these are challenges given the structure of the public service, the limitation of financial resources available to the government, and the vastly improved education and training, especially university education, of increasing numbers of the public service. Just don't have enough positions open for all the tremendous persons we are, we, 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 we are bringing out of, through the education revolution. But what we have to do is to address these challenges such as structure of the public service and resource limitations as works in progress. But in relation to appointment and promotion, fairness, objectivity, and merit must always determine the appointment and promotion. Merit does not simply mean formal qualifications. Merit is a much wider and objectively more all-embracing category, devoid of favoritism, prejudice, or other wholly subjective preference. There are some persons who come and say, well, you know, I have a master's, and this person just has a bachelor's. Well, you have to balance a number of things. Master's, the quality of your first degree, compared to the persons, or to the, how you assess the persons. The person might have been around sometime before you or even after you and your work performance and so on and so forth. You can't, look, I know most university graduates know they have to work in order to advance. They have to be disciplined and all that and I commend them and I applaud them. But there are few who unfortunately feel that when they finish their university degree, Everybody else must mind them because they have a university degree. No, that can't be the case. You know, the university degree is important. That's why we spend so much money on it. But that has to be utilized to enhance productivity and service in what you're doing if you come inside of the public service. That is required to be done. And we have some excellent ones. And those who don't pull their weight as much, when I meet them, I whisper in their ear. I say, I hear you're not delivering the way in which. And they'll give me an excuse. I say, forget about that. Take a fresh guard. You know, let's do some things. Now, I've been speaking broadly about all the public services, but I've been focusing in many examples, Michael, in the civil service. And another time I hope to talk to the police, you know, the last time you, I had an opportunity, when you had your awards, I spoke and said certain things. And I'd like to do the same in, in some of the other areas. But that is what I really have to talk to you about tonight. And I gave you a social science and legal understanding of some of the issues and did an understanding and analysis from a hopefully a scientific standpoint but did it in a manner which those who are listening to me hopefully it's not easy on the air particularly with radio because the funny thing about radio sometimes a fellow feel if He's warring with the microphone. That is good on, it may be, it may be good here. But person will turn very swiftly to bold and beautiful. <laughs> or whatever the, the Kung Fu movie, or in my case, turn a classic movie. Um, and I've given you about some of my experiences. I enlarge on some of the things just Blazer said. But as you notice, I'm very upbeat, I'm not negative, 
I put both sides of the thing. Blazer himself, I know, is not negative, but he specifically said he's using the negative this evening to prompt from his vantage points some positive. A complicated business. But I think the conversation which we have started, well, this is not the first time, which we are continuing, that um, we will see some improvements. The final word for the public servants who are in senior positions, leadership, vital. Leadership can let you down. And in the schools, what influence educational outcomes more than anything else is quality teaching and quality leadership in the schools. What influence policing is leadership at the center with the commissioner and his team, leadership in the districts at the stations, leadership in the various units, so on and so forth. Because if you don't have the leadership, a lot of things are going to fall down. And we have, we spend so much money on the public service. I think people expect to, to see ongoing enhancements in the delivery of service. And I reiterate what I began with, the first point. Let us try and emulate excellence in spirit. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me once more in applauding and appreciating the contribution made by the Prime Minister this evening. He spoke on the topic of productivity and service excellence in the public sector. Thank you very much again, Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister has consented to taking your questions and comments. So if you've got any that you wish to share this evening, uh, please use the microphone that is strategically placed in the center of the room. Just indicate by way of hand, and we will, of course, uh, take your comments. Thanks very much, and, and let me um, congratulate you and commend you on an excellent lecture tonight. Um, you certainly brought to the forefront much food for thought. I have two questions, and um, the first one has to do with um, a statement that you make on the institutional barriers, where you were mentioning the big stockpile of permission slits that you have to sign. And you ask the question, what is stopping the change? And you'd like to change that system um, so that all these permission slips don't have to come to you because it can be done at, 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 at the permanent secretary level. I'd like you to comment a little bit on what should be the process for making that change and for institutionalizing it. The permanent secretaries have to convince me that they want the authority. See what happens in a small society. People don't want to say no to somebody who wants to go to travel to northeastern Brazil to study the mating habits of boa weevils for two weeks. What I do, what I do, how we, with the ministers, because they have to get permission from me to travel. Absolutely, I wouldn't concede that because to anybody because I'm the chairman of the cabinet. But when I see their permanent secretary send something through, and then somebody along the way just send it through, somebody may have from which account it is coming. I don't put not approved. And she knows that I put on it, I will speak to the minister, PM, and I put the date and I send out the file. When the permanent secretary gets it back, permanent secretary says, the PM would like to speak to you on this. Well, they know already, because I didn't approve it, my inclination is not to approve it. Therefore, if they do not think they have a convincing argument to go, they just let it lie. So I... I, I didn't say no, 
I just say I will speak to the minister. So you can devise your own. Sometimes the public servants just send it, send it through because somebody below. And what we have to look at, you see how we, if nobody in the Ministry of Finance, for instance, I'm going on another subject, in any senior level or any working level, would be allowed to go on holidays during the time when we are preparing the estimates or preparing the budget. Absolutely impossible. You can't. Morris Edward takes his holidays around Carnival. That's fine. He love his fit. Um, this year he took it a little earlier. The point I want to make, there is, you will know the work schedule as the permanent secretary. What is available for the next two, three weeks? If somebody wants to travel during that period, and you look at what is required to be done and what might be available from this, from this travel, even though it's a travel involving no costs, no direct costs, that you say to the person, look, it's not that this is unimportant. Well, let me ask you, don't you think it is better if you're here for us to complete this task? Because the minister is asking this, we have to do this, we have to do that. And I will think if it is done, it is, it is something which is, would build relationships rather than just send it through like that and then you grumble behind it, you know, they're gone, they're gone travel again. And you should certainly discuss it as the permanent secretary, the minister, and say, look, this person wants to go, what do you think? I mean, and we have to bear in mind the not, you have to bear in mind what is it what we are doing? We are doing it for the benefit of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, whatever is being done. And sometimes a lot of these meetings, not all of them, several of them, some of them are very, very important and we have to go because of our regional international links and the value of going. But sometimes, really critically assess you would see that isn't so urgent to be done at that particular time relative to what other things you have to do. So I, I answer you in this way, Howie, that strange enough, it appears as though the public servants, the senior, some permanent secretaries prefer that I have the authority, that I am the one to say no. And my final question, Honorable Prime Minister, is if, if I was following this broadcast tonight as one of your critics, one of the statements that you made would jump out at me, and I'd love to be able to play that back several times if I was following it as your critic. The statement was on the institutional barriers when you said that there is too much manipulation within the public service by senior public servants and politicians, mm -hmm. and you didn't elaborate. Yes. Would you love to elaborate sure. so as to be able to clear the air? Sure. And by the way, you have seen a public, pol senior, po some senior public servants manipulate some politicians too, you know. I just, I just want, I mean, that's why I, I didn't elaborate. I stated it because it's a, it's a and look, In any set of relationships, people in seeking to get work done, you can do the work in some sensible, easygoing matter, in some in manner, in some consensual way, or you can decide to use a lot of smart man tactics and have people doing things which they're not even realizing the real purpose of what they're doing. 
That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about it in a way that it is, it is, it is something which is going to send the person, it's not a bullying, it's not that. It's a question of not always leveling and discussing the matter in a way which is deserving to be discussed between professionals who respect one another. And I have made this point for years, over the 50 years, not just since I'm in government, but, the, but these, the, the, the men and women in, in the cabinet, I always tell them, know the boundaries of your authority, don't cross the public servants' boundaries, and if you have a doubt, ask them. And if any of them cross your boundaries, just say, well, I don't think that one is in your domain, you know, that one is my call. That is the call between me and the PM. You know, and if, if, if you, if I, I tell them, sometimes they will find a, a senior public servant, may try to, 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 quote-unquote, manipulate them through access of information, provide you with a set of information which they want to ordain a particular result. So I would read it, and when you asking me very hurriedly, I want you to give me a decision on this. I say, well, let me read it. I will... Tomorrow morning is all right, I could talk to you about it. Let me read it, let me check it out. And as soon as I have looked at it, I said, there must be some other information here. So unknown to you, I will ask another source where the information, get the information. And if I feel that you're trying to pull one over me, I make a mental note of that. I don't hold it against you. But I'm on my guard the next time you come to me with something. And that is what I mean in Howie. It's a, it's, a, it's a complex thing. And if manipulation was the wrong word, use of people in the way people use it. But it's really, it's, it's not bullying. It's, 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 it's kind of getting somebody to do something. Um, which if the person has all the information, may not really want to do. And you tell them half of the story, part of the story, for a particular result. I mean, it's not a good thing if you're working with people on either side for me to do that to a, pu to a public servant or the public servant to do it to me. And those who work close to me know how I function with that. And if, if they tell me something, in fact, sometimes even when I say yes, I decide on something, there are public servants around me if they feel that is something, no, my decision should have gone the other way. They check it and come back and they tell me, they say, PM, I think this person tried to pull one on you, you know. And I have good people around me who do that to me because I have, um, I have that relationship with them. For us to have the results orientation about what is good for the office, good for the country, and so on and so forth. And, and sometimes... People may do it innocently, innocently. Um, the, sometimes somebody may come and tell me something about a particular public servant and what they don't want that public servant, you know, don't assign that person that responsibility and whatever and so on and so on. And I will say, well, who else you have in mind? If you tell me you don't have anybody else in mind, well, you're not in the real world with me. If you give me some other information, I will say, well, let me think about Tom and Dick. 
rather than Harry, whom I wanted to do this, and so on and so forth. That is what I'm talking about, Howie. Um, of course, there are several things I said tonight which the critic could splice things. It's not the first time they'd splice things on me. <laughs> Neither would it be the last. <laughs> but where are you going? It's not easy to splice things against a man who has been around for so long. People get to know you. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, PM. Good night, and you. thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, just in the interest of public discussion on the point, you, you made reference to the fact that some people enter the civil service, the public service, well qualified and so on, but they uninitiate, they're not initiated in <coughs> the business of the public service and basically don't know the laws and other issues relevant to their employment. And in thinking about how we might address this in a systemic way, uh, my mind went to possibly the model employed in the Republic of China, for instance, where one of the arms of government actually relates, strictly speaking, to the public service. And I think that one of the things they do as a condition precedent to employment there is have an examination in which you know, all candidates for public service employment, that all candidates for public service employment are required to take. Uh, I'm wondering if in our context that may be something that we could learn from and either adopt and adopt in one way or another, or if there is something else that we might do to help broaden the knowledge base of those who are going to enter the public service. Yes, well, I know the public service Commission, the training division, they have programs. And each ministry has a vote for training. But above all, Luke, if you train somebody, for, you have them for seven years at the primary school. You have them for five at secondary school. That's 12. Two at the community college. That's 14. And five, three, sorry, at university. That is 17. And they are now 22. And the state, and of course your family, I've trained you formally for 17 of your 22 years. It might be 20 out of 30 years, depending on, I'm just giving the rough numbers. What I want to say to those individuals, the same critical faculty which you use to help you to research your paper, to get your A, in whatever subject you, you decide that you're going to get an A in, you must use your same critical faculties to read and study on yourself. And that what the public service, what the head of department can do, what the permanent secretary can do, is to say to you, look, there are these things which you need to study, which you need to read, you need to follow. If you intend to make the public service your career, start to learn about these things. What you're doing here is important. It's part of a, a process. Simple decisions. You take, let's take an example. Look, and I, 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 I've given you one now outside of the public service proper. I'm giving you now with the police force. A person who is married to a Vincentian who applies for citizenship. They come, they lodge their papers, their forms and so on, they fill them out, they process in some way or the other. They do all kind of write-ups. All the necessary documentation is there. The cabinet secretary sends it for me. I read the file. But the question is now, should I grant citizenship 
to that spouse of a Vincentian. Under the Constitution, you are entitled to be registered as a citizen. Oh, sorry, you have the right to be registered as a citizen. Let me put it that way. It's not like if you're a Vincentian by birth, born overseas, where from the moment you're born, you're a citizen. From the moment you're married, you're not a citizen. You have to be registered as a citizen. So you have to go through a process. That's what the Constitution says. But one of the things I would want to find out, what I'd like to have on the record, is whether this is a marriage of convenience. Because if it is a marriage of convenience, it's not a bona fide basis on which to ground an application for citizenship. So I send the document, I send the file back to the cabinet secretary and say, please get a special branch report on this matter. If the special branch officer sends back to me, yes, the person is staying, the, the, somebody in the neighborhood say that, they say that they're only married for citizenship, and that kind of a loose hearsay talk. I will send it back and say, where is the transcript of your questioning the two persons to the marriage, in addition to whatever else you ask, where you put specifically to them questions relating to whether this marriage is a marriage of convenience or not? Because they have to have, that, that spouse has a right to have that question put to them and have it answered. Now, if the special branch officer is well trained and knows that Luke, it doesn't have to take the journey, they send up special branch report, they go to the cab, say it comes back to me, the length of time which elapsed, they have to go back and do something. They know from their training, or they ought to know, this is the legal position. That's what I mean. I can find several other examples. I choose that one because Michael is here and obvious. There, there are so many things that you acquaint yourself with from the rules and the laws in relation to the job, what you are doing. It's the only way you can get your work done. And you yourself must be a self-respecting professional to seek to learn about these things. A policeman can't be satisfied with the six months of training and saying that he knows the criminal code. Yeah. Out of that six months, maybe he has three weeks maximum on the criminal code and the criminal procedure code. Well, it takes the DPP several years at university to learn the criminal code and the criminal procedure code and to know it inside out. And because he knows what the policeman knows one or two sections, he can't be satisfied with that. I don't expect him to be a lawyer, but he has to familiarize himself and know where the pitfalls, and importantly, to go to senior persons to ask them the right questions in order to get the guidance and the answer. All that involves in being a professional. And that's the point I'm making, Luke. In addition to the formal training which my brother Burke and his division does and which the public sector reform unit does and so on and so forth. That is the way in which I will answer you. You yourself have a responsibility. If you don't want to be a serious public servant, well then, you're a board of passage, you're spending a short while, you're doing what you want to do, you know what I mean? But that's a different story. Prime Minister, good evening. Good evening, Capsec. I, uh, I came down here this evening because I know that you're a great teacher and I was not disappointed. Now, over the years, different administrations and quite recently, we have had the argument that one of the barriers to high levels of productivity and efficiency in the public service 
is what some people term to be political victimization and administrative victimization. I would want to have your response to this this evening, Prime Minister. Yes. Thank you. Well, first of all, there is any political victimization or any victimization based on any of the following grounds is unconstitutional. Political beliefs and opinions, religion, sex, ethnicity. Section 13 of the Constitution precisely outlaws those things. Of course, the Constitution doesn't outlaw discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, but that is an issue which currently is on debate. And, um, but I'm just saying what the Constitution prescribes, because you asked me that. I'm not saying that you must discriminate against someone on the basis of, don't get me wrong, of sexual orientation. It's just that the, the Constitution does not prescribe it. That's all I was saying in that list. Now, you have been in the public service, and you know how promotion is done. Let's take teachers, because I hear this a lot with teachers. The persons who are most influential in determining who gets appointed are the senior education officers whose noses are close to the cold face. The chief education officer, the deputy chief education officer, the permanent secretary, and so on. They don't know these individuals. They know some of them. So people who interact and they get reports and the like. The recommendations come to Blazer as chairman of the Public Service Commission. If it's a post for which there should be advertisement, well, they will interview them. But invariably, they will go along with the recommendations from the ministry. But the way the recommendations come from the ministry, surely it is not the most scientific way in a modern state administration. That's, a, that's when you had few teachers, a few public servants. I don't have anything to do with that. The politicians don't have anything to do with that. But if Mary, who happens to be not a supporter of the ULP, doesn't get promoted, she may feel that it is because she didn't support the ULP. And if Mary gets promoted and Elizabeth doesn't, and Elizabeth is a strong supporter of the ULP. They say, but I run up behind you and then you give Mary who in the village cussing you every day. And look, she get promotion and people laughing after me. Meaning laughing at me. That's how we use after in St. Vincent. Um, but there's no politics involved, Bernard. But a small island society, there's this milieu. And because of the nature of competitive politics, that arises. Now, the Constitution says that you cannot appoint a permanent secretary unless you get the approval from the Prime Minister. And the Constitution in its wisdom, did it like that. Because they say, we expect the Prime Minister to be fair, but because of the, the, the position of permanent secretary, we know that the Prime Minister would have a range of considerations which he or she may consider. 
Somebody may say it is a political appointment, but the first thing I look for in a permanent secretary is that they can do the job. And I'm looking for someone also who is not going to subvert the administration. So I'm not so much interested as to whether you're supporting me or not politically, but that you're not going to subvert the administration. You have your political views, it's your business, so long as you do the work, what is required of you. And you will see, because I don't know the political inclinations of a lot of public uh, permanent secretaries. When you, when you were appointed permanent secre um, cabinet secretary, I surveyed the scene, I asked for advice from different people. It's my judgment call. And I knew you from time immemorial, and I knew your competence, and I knew we can work well together. Now, Blazer could have said, as chairman of the Public Service Commission, he's suggesting Tom or Jerry. I said, Blazer, I appreciate you want Tom or Jerry. I don't want that. I want Bernard. He comes back with Elizabeth. I say, no, Bernard. So he'd have to give me Bernard because the Constitution says at some stage, he has to give me what I want. At that level. Same thing with the commission of police. The no, no prime minister is going to have appointed a commission of police who is seeking to undermine him or the administration. And that'd be absolutely ridiculous. But as you go down the ranks, I mean, if, if there was, if you had political interference, as people say, you would expect that there would be inside of the police, for instance, or inside of the public service, a disproportionately large number of those persons supporting the government. But what you have is a mixture. I would expect that most of the public servants support the government, most of the police support the government, because most of the country support the government. <laughs> I mean, so it is not an unusual phenomenon. So what must I do? In order to show that I am so independent politically, I must ensure that the commissioner opposes me, that I must set about to have, I mean, what, what happened? I look into a headache? No. But that does not mean that I tell the commissioner what to do in the conduct of his, of his work. I don't do that. There are many times I say, well, Michael, that is your management issue. That is your issue in relation to management. That's not about me. He wants, he wants seven new vehicles. I just organized and approved them for you to get. Um, and because that comes to the permanent secretary. I can't tell him the seven people he must put to drive. But I could say to him, make certain that you get people to drive these seven vehicles. We ain't going to mash them up. And therefore, I could say you have training in place, you have responsible people. That's a management issue because if as soon as the vehicle is in their hands, that one of them crash. I call Michael, I say, Michael, I give you the thing. What, what kind of man you got on and, 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 and drive this brand new vehicle? What kind of situation is this? Tell me, answer me. He has to answer me that. And so on. I, I hear the allegations. Bernard and I always answer it with this. And I, I, I want to be, I'm sorry if I embarrass Angie and Angela in as much as you ask this. Angie worked 
as secretary to our name Eustace is the only person she had worked with for five years or thereabouts since she left school in different positions which she occupied in the government. Fiscal advisor, minister of finance, and the five months she was prime minister. But she is now, the, she has the position of executive secretary to the office of the prime minister. She's a university graduate, she's well trained. She did all her she did programs in executive secretarial work, etc. Very efficient. And she is now working with me, first as the assistant secretary, assistant private secretary, when Angela was in that, in her chair. And then when Angela became senior assistant secretary in the cabinet office, and Angie went up. And she's with me now for almost 16 years or more. I'm with her. <laughs> I, I must say that because she's much younger than I am, and any time I get thrown out of my office, she's still a permanent secretary. She's still a public servant. I have to be watch, walking, passing on the road, and she going to work and serving whoever else the people decide. So that I'm working with her really. Because um, Angela had worked with Sir James for 12 years before I arrived. She's still there. With me. They've worked longer, I've worked longer with them, and they, they have had, I'm the person whom they've seen most <laughs> in their work, in their work situation. And I'll tell you, the first, on the, on the day when I arrived, Bernard, the Friday, the elections were on Wednesday to Thursday was a holiday. Friday, I turned up there about 10 o'clock. I said, good morning, ladies. I say you must have heard that the, the Governor General swore me in as Prime Minister. I've come to see the geography of the office. I say, yes, Prime Minister. They showed me, I gave some instructions. I don't have to go through what the instructions I gave. But, I mean, I'll tell you, for one, for instance, Michael, the fridge had some rust on it. And it, you know, when you go inside, somebody who, who was just, can't manage to buy a fridge that it's it rusty and it, you open it and you feel it, it ain't cooling properly and it lean over, it has a piece of cardboard underneath. I say, Heavenly Father, I say, I mean, I'll buy a new fridge now. I mean, this is the first instruction. <laughs> you, you, you know, Michael, I mean, what to do with this? I say, I don't know how you do with things when the thing is about, give me a new fridge tomorrow, man. I mean, I mean, for Monday, I mean, what kind of thing all you have here? You know, and so on and so forth. I said to them, this is the truth. I said, you all are apprehensive that I might ask you all to leave here and go elsewhere in the public service and bring other people. They said, yes. I said, do you want to stay here with me? They said, yes. I said, well, my spirit take you all. <laughs> and that was my way of saying it jokingly. But I had had reason to interface with them while they served Sir James and, and Mr. Eustace. And they had treated me with great respect and professionalism. And I made a mental note. I said, well, my spirit take care, I want to. I said, well, let me talk a few things. I say, I get to work early in the mornings and I work late. So you have to tell your boyfriends, but neither was married at the time to get accustomed to that. They say they get accustomed, yes. Um, I assumed they had boyfriends. I said, what is it, where you reach your educational level, they tell me. I said, well, you all have to decide who's going off to train first and who's going to f do their degree first. When you all decide, tell me. I said, because once you're wrong, you have to study. I said, the other thing, from today, because I'm the prime minister, Apart from we doing work together, you have to be loyal to me. The king is dead, long live this king. <laughs> huh? I put it in a joking form, and they themselves laugh. But we all know, because obviously if you're a secretary of the prime minister, it's a position of tremendous trust. Tremendous trust. And never one day, 
in the nearly 16 years that we are working together that either Eustace or Sir James could get any information from them. None whatsoever. Because they're professional people and they're very efficient and everything. I didn't use politics. I have not, I didn't use politics. I didn't ask them what was their politics. I mean, I ain't come from Mars. I expect they're wrong this along with them. They probably had a preference for them. So what? You know, and people pick me too, they might get to like me. <laughs> you know, you, you, you know what I mean? And that's how I deal with it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, these things, when I hear these discussions, I am not, I'm not saying that there's a perfect government that there's no political decision make it at anywhere with anything, but not with these matters. I will tell you this. The cabinet secretary said to me, God, they were choosing through their system scholarships to go to Cuba for medicine. They had, a, they had chosen several persons, but there were two other positions where they had through postgraduate work. And nobody applied for those two. So I asked her to contact the Cuban ambassador to make the formal request to, to have us had two more undergraduates since nobody had applied for the two postgraduate scholarships to go to Cuba to do in medicine. And when I was away this last time here, she said, you know, Prime Minister, um, the, we are deciding, you know, the, 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 minister, the, the Cuban authorities said we can have two persons. I said, well, you all make sure that you all select the next two persons in, line, in the light of their qualifications. And as usual, no friend, friend business, eh? Those are the words I used to her. I don't, I'm asking the names which, which, are, which the public servants through there dealing with it in the authoritative way. They have dealt with that. I am not saying that here and there you would not have some of that bias. I know, for instance, when you have road workers, the senior road supervisor is the one in my constituency who choose who work in. But they will go to various persons in the community and ask who you think. They say, well, sometimes they say, well, you know, I'm going to ask Beverly. I say, Beverly, where? They tell me Beverly. I say, well, let me tell you this. If you go and ask Beverly, and Beverly gives you 10 names, don't take more than three from Beverly, eh? <laughs> so she said, he'd say, why? I said, Beverly is an original Ralph woman. And as far as she's concerned, anybody who come after the small group that supported me during the days of the MNU is not a genuine Ralph man. And therefore, she has a particular attitude. You know what I mean, Bernard? I, I, I will guide the people, you know, and who they put on, who they put to work because. And I'm not saying that at that level you may not have some of these things happening. And I'm not making it sound that I'm pure and abstract and in the sky. I'm just saying that what they talk about political victimization, I know I'm not involved in any of that. And I encourage my, my um, ministers to be very careful with things like that. And I believe that the public trusts me on this question. They will say, Ralph Guy, you know. But I say for them with that. That's how I'd answer you, Bernard. I'm not doing it in any high principle. I outline, first of all, what is the legal basis and to tell you how I function. Ordinary and practical. Thank you, Prime Minister.
Yeah, good night, PM. Well, I am not really a civil servant, but I come here tonight really to, to at least analyze with people's sociocultural attitude. I, the reason why I say that, I had occasion to go to a public service, similar thing like this in Antigua, Frank I came me day. And come here when I went there, the house was packed. I, I went to St. Kitts, the same thing. Now, what are, what, are, what are analyzing with my country and my people? Now, this, the public services are big. Something what I think is a big force in the country, one of the biggest, largest employers force in the country from the government. And I am a bit surprised to see when I come here that you didn't have much turnout. In, 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 in based on the good works that this government is doing, the kind of opportunity, for instance, the 100% mortgage loan for public servant, long time a public servant, that will wait till you nearly retire and you get it lump sum to go and build house and I really questioning if we people are really civic minded if we people really love St. Vincent like how I notice in them other places no, they, they, they love it let yeah. me tell you something I only hope so no no let me tell you what happened I told the cab sec tonight if you had this event at nine o'clock on a Thursday morning, the place will be full. Public servants will come, they'll get time off and so on, and they will come. I have noticed that, generally speaking, public servants do not turn out in large numbers to any set of events on a weekday. They go home, and it's not easy to get them to come out back after, um, you know, and, 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 and look, you know, several, there are several things, you know. You, you are a, you're a mother of a child, two children, and you go home. You pick up the child from daycare. Who is going to stay with your child or your two children this evening to come and listen to Ralph? Hmm? It's a it's a problem. Well, I only hope you know, and then and, 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 and then and then and then the other thing is this: the the broadcast on. Radio on and TV. For instance, Montgomery Daniel said to me, PM is coming on TV. I said, I think they're trying to get it on VC3. He said, well, I'll watch it there. Because when cabinet finished today, about 4 o'clock, Montgomery is not going to hang around until 7 o'clock. And when he, go, when he reached Sandy Bay, he ain't going to come back from Sandy Bay to come back down here. So there, there are all kinds of practical reasons and um, I'm satisfied that we have a sufficient number of persons here and, and we are involved in, a, in, a, in an interesting discussion, which certainly will, will continue. Well, uh, I trust the government, Pierre. Okay, thank you, Pierre. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Bergs. Good evening, PM. God bless you, man. Thanks. PM, you, you raised an issue and it's a concern I have, even while I was still a member of the public service. And it relates to knowledge of the regulations yes. that govern public servants. I know it's a very serious problem. Many public servants do it. When I entered the public service, there was a training session where we went for, I think it was three weeks. Well, the public service has changed considerably. So persons were guided in the civil service orders, the financial and store rules, the regulations, things relative to the con constitution, a host of things. And over the years, you have found persons come through the system, for instance, and they virtually don't learn anything relative to those regulations. And that is a fact. I've experienced it within the service. I'm not pulling, pull 
I remember a, a public song. I have, I have seen it too, my brother. That's why I raise it. Yes, it, it, it's a very serious problem. And some persons just don't want to learn them. I remember very seeing a public servant at one point in time we were at a training session in the 80s. And he said, when I came back here from university, imagine they gave me a financial story from 1952 and want me to read that. I said, well, that is what guides you. That is what tells you how the operations of the financial operation of government function. This is how the government function by those. And he was, but I don't want to read this. This has no interest in me. It was interesting that several years later, he, he ran into a snag in respect of it. And the approach man was asking me something. He said, well, look, a couple of years ago, you were saying you don't have to learn this. Now look, here you are. But these are the guidelines. And I think at the service commission's level, and it could be something that even permanent secretaries in, in, in system, so that person, the, the body, but at the service commission's level, that, 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 that um, training aspect of public servants, when they come in, it, it should really be, if I say, enshrined in the whole thing. We are the level of the public service union, and where, where I'm an officer there. We have had at least five training sessions for public servants in various areas. We have utilized Mr. Morgan Bonard, we have utilized the Accountant General, we have utilized the Director of Audit and a number of other persons, and we have put our own input into it. But I think it is very, very important so that persons would know this is what guides us, this is what we're supposed to do. I, I remember a few years ago when the ex Executive Diploma in Management was introduced within the service when persons were doing it. And a number of the persons who were doing that course contacted me to, to um, train them in respect of the, 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 um, the warrants in government. Yes. And persons had never seen, and you talk about persons who are in the system 20 years, had never seen a warrant. One of the reasons for that is a number of persons had not gone in the upcoming section of their particular department, so they would not have been able to learn them, that sort of thing. You know, and I was saying, hey guys, you are here. But, but the point I want to make here, and we, we have this conversation here, somebody who is in the system, for such a long period of time, do they not have a curiosity, Aubrey? Do they not have a curiosity to say, well, how these things happen? You know, like this person, you say, who had come back from university. And I'm not surprised uh, that um, a number of the persons who go and come back have a disregard for these regulations. Y you know, but in addition to all the training you're talking about, which must be done formally, we have to insist that you have to take, we can lead you to it. For instance, those students whom you got for the executive MBA, the sessions which you give them would familiarize them and they will pass their exams because you familiarize them. But if they stay only at that level of familiarization which help them to pass the exams, they don't know how to draft to fill in what is required for environment warrant or a special warrant. Eh? Yeah. What all are the requisites? They don't, because you have to have a, and you have to have an attention to detail in respect of all of those things. And public servants, this is why I made the point just now. When they go to, a number of people go to university and they read a number of things from people in public administration. And they say that you, it is a bureaucracy with a lot of archaic rules and procedures, and they dismiss them. They're not archaic rules and procedures. They are rational rules and regulations to get things done and to provide responsibility and accountability and transparency. And the director of audit, when the director of audit writes the report, the director of audit doesn't attack a politician, you know. I am not 
an accounting officer in any ministry. The residence which the people have put me. I don't have anything to do with any repairs or anything which is done to that house, you know. The accounting officer is the cabinet secretary. And anybody comes and asks me, I said, ask the cabinet secretary, she's the accounting officer. I go there, I sleep, I read. It's not my house. I'm taking care of it and so on. And if anything goes wrong, I draw it to their attention. Or I just say, you should really go by the house you know, and see what's happening. The accounting officer. And when the director of audit presents her report, I always, I read them and I ask the accounting officers, why do you have these outstanding queries you didn't answer? Why are these strictures made against you, against your department, not you personally, but your department or your ministry? And you have to do something to improve it. Because, and that is for the same reason why the the PS was there before, the CAPSEC was there before Bernard, and Morris Edwards has been there as Director General, that I insisted that the accommodation for the Director of Audit, the staff, everything be improved, that they don't require permission to go anywhere to audit, they have an independent vote, and so on. We introduce all those things. Why? Because I want to see accountability. I want to see the controls. Because the Constitution says that. And, and, um, and if people follow the rules, I know sometimes you may have a director, you may have a director of audit who may write you up and inquire why two cents missing at the registry. When you reconcile, you will see people. Uh, they say, well, you know, I have to get two cents because the diary. You can't take it from your pocket and put it, you know. Because it has to be accommodated on the paperwork. If, a, if an error is made there on the paperwork. And that's why you have all these regulations. Sometimes it may appear difficult. But they're there for a particular reason. And I'm very glad that as a public service public service union leader, even though you're not in the public service, you're one of the leaders of the unions, that it is something I believe, Aubrey, that you can push more and more, in fact, as you are doing it here, and I agree with you 100%. Yeah, just one thing I want to say, PM, I think every public servant should know what the appropriation bill is. Very important. When it relates to the same regulations and a number of things, and all it, other things relative to that, the and supplementary date and all those, the supplementary estimates and all those things, because far too many people are unaware of the very importance of these other I, I, for instance, and also the estimates, yes. I have a copy of the estimates right at my, at my right hand. When anybody comes and says anything to me, I say, well, hold on, let me see what the estimates say. So that's the first thing. I say, no, it's not in the estimates. If it's not in the estimates, the next procedure, how do we, is, can we find it somewhere else in the estimates? Can we have it shifted from one place to another? There's a procedure to do that. Is it exceptional, urgent, unforeseen, which requires a special warrant? Yes. This is, and so on and so forth. And this is the way in which, but, and if you know the rules, they're, they're simple, you know. They're not complicated business. All you have to just alter your mindset. But I'll tell you something. What is my experience? I don't know if Blazer would agree with me. He, he has come to law by way of the social sciences. I do. If you do a degree in the social sciences and you haven't done after you have done your degree, a significant amount of detailed research, 
there is a tendency for you to be extremely conceptual and you're brimful of a lot of ideas very good but you have an aversion to details but the devil is in the details so you have to have the concept you have to have that how you can change things so you can be innovative in the case of your training in law please you have to know the particular section in the law there's a greater attention to minute details and that is what we have to do in the public service in order to have the big conceptual things and so on and at the same time we have to get these very small things right i just want to raise two points here with you thanks now you mentioned you said in in your thing you use the phrase carry the enterprise forward yes and that leaped out at me and i would venture to say the macro enterprise is doing the best for the society with the resources available so i am forced to draw to your attention two issues the first one is the seeming unreasonably long delay in the replacing of that vital pedestrian crossing in the area between the thomas honest secondary school and the national library we must not continue to seem indifferent to the safety of our children in particular. The reality is that even where there are properly marked out pedestrian crossings, drivers, many of them, are indifferent and reckless. Can but let me, let, on the, that first one, Michael is right here. Um, the commissioner, who is responsible the, in, in the management of that in the sense of the road traffic. Yeah. Why, 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 why it isn't there? You have any idea? So you get, you get answer from the commissioner. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I think the problem there is that the resurfacing of the road isn't completed as yet, really. So as soon as that is finished, then the road will be. But if, let us assume that the resurfacing is not complete, but we still should have, do we have a police officer there to help the children? Yes, yes, yes. yes okay. Yes, yes, yes. No, I just, I just want to ask that. Okay, well, I, the other part I could say why the road is not, I will tell you this, Pravi. Yeah. There was, Franco Construction had the road from the top to come right down. Yeah. I had said to Brent some time ago, I said, listen, discuss with the Director General of Finance and Planning, since Franco is taking so long, terminate, give consideration to terminate the contract. I can't terminate it as I could suggest to them. Because they had a difficulty getting hot mix. They sold their hot mix plant and then couldn't get hot mix. This place, what they call the other hot mix place they had here by Dean, the chief engineer said that the, the, for that road and for the specifications required, the hot mix from Dean establishment didn't meet the specifications. So the opportunity arose when Dipcon, during the road on Leeward, the South Leeward and they have, they set up the plant and they have the requisite hot mix. He, well he had terminated Franco before, have a new tendering process. And uh, Dipcon won. But unfortunately, the office of the chief engineer only put in the tender for part of the road rather than the whole road to take you down to down, down, down to down to customs so when i saw the thing i asked the minister of works i said what the hell happening why is it 
Why dip can't stop there? He said to me that that is the portion for which the chief engineer had tendered for this. And I asked Brent. He said, Prime Minister, it was an error. No. Brent has a lot of work doing. He's a good public servant. It should have done for the whole area going on. Because the money for that is available in a separate account. So this is where you have, I give you an explanation about a practical problem. Michael is here. He tells you why yeah. he don't want. But the point is this. What, what, what should happen? Yeah. Michael shouldn't function, I'm suggesting, as though is a government, the police is not a government on its own. You should go to Brent and say, listen, chief engineer, when do you think we're going to complete this thing? If the chief engineer can't give him a specific time which is reasonable, he should simply go there on a Sunday, get his workers, his, his, the police to run traffic, and paint it. Sure. Yeah. You, you understand the point I'm making? Sure. And I'm glad, the reason why all this is important, you raise this problem, and all the issues you raise, I agree with 100%. I give you the explanation, and this is where these kind of dialogues, these kinds of discussions are important. Unfortunately, we don't have as much of them for all kinds of reasons, time constraints and so forth. But what we should do is to a responsible person like yourself, I read my mail. If you don't do email, you have one of the, the children or grandchildren say, so send this email for Ralph Gimme. As soon as I get that email, I put in on it to Angie, copy to Brent and Commissioner Police. But Mr. Premis, all your respect. We shouldn't have to burden you with those small I know, matters. I know. Because I, I am still arguing. Notwithstanding what the gentleman has said, you have us the road already surfaced. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. Eight weeks ago, I raised the issue with a senior man in the traffic department, and he assured me that the thing would be done next week. The next week, that's eight weeks ago. Well, I'm glad you raised it here. And what another one is telling me is that, okay, because the road surface just prepared a thing. It will, but so here now, that is only one gallon of paint we're talking about. You're 100% right. So if we paint it today and it is erased, three days, paint it back again, this is the safety of the children we have, we have, we're talking in about. In fact, sometimes, my brother, we do the road and we coordinate well with CWSA. And in a week, a week they dig it up back. Yeah. So what is what is a gallon of tour paint? Well, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm happy that you have given me this, this response. Yes. So that is taken care of. Yes. Good. But um, yeah, another one is the, um, bear with me there. The villagers, the residents of Colesville, and the other villages there of the parishes in David are pained by the apparent neglect relative to the road, which has on two occasions caused loss of life. I myself am still grieving the loss of George Johnson, an old farmer. Yes. And he, he used to be on the road every, almost every day. Yes. On donkey or on foot. The citizens of the district are hoping for your intervention, Mr. Prime Minister, because that seems to be <laughs> what will help them out. I would hope that this gathering here would be fruitful and that there would be results. I am haunted, however, by the memory of a well-attended gathering that was held in this very hall around June the 10th, 2004, during which decisions were taken and commit commitments made to secure the banana industry. Those efforts seem to have failed. My eyes are now on the new 20-point 100-day plan. Mr. Prime Minister, I hope you could give me reason to be hopeful. Yes. Any words of comfort? I Thanks. Now, in relation to the problem at, at Coles Hill, 
Don't know if you have heard me on it before on Julian and Brent Bailey himself, the chief engineer. There is a project targeted. I believe it's under the regional disaster vulnerability project funded by the World Bank. It's either that one or under the or under the the disaster program of the Caribbean Development Bank. It's one out of the two because we have several all about. Anyway, there's there is a there's funding arranged for that. And Brent Bailey has assured me that they are preparing the designs for the or the persons who are in front of who who are preparing the designs for the particular project. It's a fairly expensive project, eh? What they're going to do there. So that's that's in relation to that. I'm just of course like you and I, we urge people simply to drive there with care until we, we do that part of it. But there is there is something for that. Several other places too. Um, with, with, with danger of that kind. In relation to the banana industry, you know, there are several efforts which have been made between 2001 and up to now. And you're right about 2004. What has happened with us, and you would appreciate, the fundamentally altered market condition and market regime, the condition is different from the trading regime itself, removal of the preferences, made life extremely difficult for the banana industry. I will say this to you, we have a banana services unit, and we have done several restructurings. We have, we have a banana services unit where it's four and a half million dollars a day about, might be four, four and a half million dollars. It's always in that range. And over three and a half million dollars is for the spraying and all the related things. There's a lot of money which is put into, into that. And the banana, the farmer support company has provided a, a fair amount of resources for for farmers, other resources too. But I know currently, because the, the, the chief executive officer of Winfresh came to me, Saboto was at the meeting, Montgomery, Daniel, other people from the Ministry of Agriculture and the team from Winfresh. And I know Saboto and Montgomery, Daniel. Montgomery, Daniel, both on the Winfresh board and also because he's the Minister of Lands. They are identifying lands a state lands about 200 250 acres and to use that as a new base with additional lands from farmers who have private lands to where winfresh would assist in supporting them in respect of revitalizing for winfresh for the uk market winfresh came to us because winfresh is having problems with bananas from the Dominican Republic and their, one of their supermarket purchasers has indicated to them that the irregular supply for what they had agreed is creating some challenges for them and if they don't give the assurances that they have a plan to correct it they may have to go to another marketing agency so this is why they come to the they come to us and Dominica and also um, St. Lucia. And in the case of us, they've identified, I got a report on it from Montgomery just this week that he has the lands identified and they're working on it today at cabinet. I asked them to give me a brief report also. So that is, a, that is an area where they're working on. And I know Winfresh is involved in that actively. Yesterday, the European Union ambassador was here. And you might have heard, the, we have signed the contracts for $19 million worth of projects. 
roads, but a big one is the, which is about four and a half million dollars EC, is the greenhouse park up in Montreal, which is going to be constructed. So there are several things, some, a number of things, but I dealt with them yesterday and the European Union man and Sabota to some extent, the yeah, European, European Union ambassador. There are some things being, the private sector people in, in, in Coco seem to be picking up. And right now, in the case of Vinci Fresh, when I went down to, when I went down to Venezuela, about two weeks ago, I saw the chief executive officer of the, the Alba Bank about some things. And he said to me, look, for Vinci Fresh, we had said that, we had, since November last year, they said that they're prepared to entertain an application for a low cost $5 million US loan to Vinci Fresh, which is majority owned by Win Fresh. They do some trading there at the moment. Um, and everybody had a meeting. I came back. I asked, well, why is this? What is the information? They said, they, they, what is Vin, Win Fresh doing? Vinci Fresh. I was given a report today. And there are some technical things being done there to push that. And I asked Gerald Thompson to draft for me a letter, which I will send off a more, to leverage it more politically now with the comrades in Caracas now to say, listen, there's this thing, I have an interest in it, see how fast we can push it, etc., etc. So there are a number of items like that. Those are, those are some just in the last two days which I've been working on with him. So I'm going to talk with you more than that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. On behalf of all the public servants, especially the committee, we really want to show your appreciation for the lovely lecture you provided. So there's a little token. Thank you very much.